Hersam Acorn Newspapers, publishers of the Greenwich Post, New Canaan Advertiser, the Darien Times, the Ridgefield Press, the Weston Forum, the Wilton Bulletin, the Reading Pilot, the Lewisboro Ledger, the Monroe Courier, the Eastern Courier, the Trumbull Times, Fairfield Sun, Shelton Herald, the Stratford Star, the Milford Mirror, and the Valley Gazette. Person Acorn and HANradio.com. The leader in local news, sports, arts, and entertainment in southwestern Connecticut. How can they listen? Good morning. It's The Drive with Denise DiGregoli, and we're now on HAN Network, live Fridays, and you can find us again on HAN Network's archives. Did I say that right, Rob? Yes, you did, Denise. Give a dog a bone. <laughs> <laughs> Seven months later, I might have just gotten it right for the f- uh. at the first go. Anyways, The Drive has been on HAN Network now just about seven months, and what The Drive is all about is motivational, intelligent talk that brings uh, personal development, professional development, and contemporary relative, uh, relevant uh, topics, but in a positive way. So it's summer, and we were kind of thinking about, what are we going to do? Summer is winding down, and all of a sudden, that rush of the crazy, frenzied back to school comes into, <laughs> you just can't avoid it. It's just right up there in your face. And coming with that, is all these choices and decisions to be made. And I was thinking, what would be important that I want to talk about that other people might need to hear and talk about as well? And I thought, there's so many times we're making our kids nuts. (laughs) Although we run around saying they make us nuts. We're kind of making them nuts by giving them too many choices to make and then maybe forcing them down one certain avenue or maybe some parents are giving them so many things to do in so many avenues, like in my newsletter, we're making them sort of burnt out road pancakes. And I thought, well, based on my background and some of my friends, we know that there's some critical things that go on in school that we take for granted. And maybe if we empowered our kids in a different way, when it came time to make those decisions, they might feel a little more empowered to do so and less like a road pancake. So today, I have a good friend, Margaret Capron, with me. She's an art educator here in our Fairfield Public Schools. And Margaret's going to talk to us about an inside look at some things that go on in our art classrooms, our school classrooms, that we probably think we know, but we don't really know, that are critical to our kids' problem-solving skills, cognitive thinking skills, and, of course, helping them make better decisions, hopefully. So welcome, Margaret. Thank you so much, Denise, for having me. And thanks for coming on sort of last minute. It's like all good things happen for a reason. <laughs> yeah, like 24 hours ago, I was like, sure, I'll be on your television show. Okay. <laughs> Can you put together a schematic quickly? <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself and why you chose school teaching. Did someone force you into that role? Absolutely not. Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> um, it sort of came across. Um, I went to Rhode Island School of Design, and I was a major in illustration, and it was I loved it. It was a lot of fun. It was a, a great way for me to um, visually interpret text and turn words into pictures. Um, as I approached my last year at the uh, RISD, I just decided, you know, um, I took an internship actually at an advertising agency where I was basically doing, um, you know, little grunt work, sweat bottles on the beer bottle top, you know, and the art director breathing down your neck. And I thought, this is this is great and all, but it's not as rewarding. Mm. So I went into uh, teaching. I went to Syracuse University, and it was just this great. It opened up a whole new world for me where I can still be so creative. Right. I'm so creative, and um, it's not about. Uh, you know, creating something visual. It's just about creating something in front of me, creating a, a inspiration for uh, my students, creating and inspiring their love for making things and being proud of things. So oftentimes, I know, having an art background myself, people take the art classroom for granted. It's like an elective. And I always say on this show, someday if I have a pile of money, I'm going to spend it on putting cursive back in the classrooms, and I'm going to you know, put more art back in the classrooms and art that has meaning. So we think that uh, art that we buy maybe in summer camp is, you know, just 
an add-on, an extra, a no big deal. Right. Uh, every I'm not creative, but I need to let my kids do it, so I shove them in that class. But what goes on? And now you're a high school art teacher. Yes. But it's equally as important in elementary school. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, but tell me what goes on and how, because you had said to me, I'm more about helping children be their own problem solvers. Yes. Tell me what goes on in art classroom that the parents don't know. Well, it's definitely... Or that they take for granted, Right, well, say. it's definitely um, problem solving. And you, know, you do problem solving all day in school. You do problem solving for math, social studies, even writing. You do you know, a lot of creative problem solving. But with art, it's almost like there is no right or wrong answer. It's just finding out who you are. Um, something I encourage students to do is just draw in their sketchbook. When I hand them a sketchbook at the beginning of the year, I don't mean it for it to be an assignment book. I mean it for them to be their journey. There, you know, this is the first page of your journey. Mm -hmm. Write about it. Reflect on it. I want you to, you know, cut, paste, do whatever. Don't think of it as the sacred book of, you know, drawings and I can only work in pencil and I must shade. Throw it all in there. Write down ideas. So when I'm teaching adults the Daily Drive workshop, which includes some do doodling, the first thing they say is, oh, someone's going to judge it. Is it wrong? Oh, it's not right. I can't draw. You draw. You're the art teacher. You went to art school. Right. But the truth be told... Um, we all know how to draw because we all drew those little stick figures. Absolutely. And they, and, you and they know, work. <laughs> and that art on our refrigerator from zero to fifth grade is revered, right? And somewhere along the line, right after fifth grade, people are like, mm, that doesn't look good. That's wrong. And so we, the children or the kids start to shrink back and they start to judge their own work. Yes. So how do you draw that out of them when you hand them that sacred notebook? How well, especially you? in high school because they're already you know, ninth graders. They come in. They just got out of middle school. It's a whole new world for them. And I start them with their first assignment is draw me a journey. Draw me, you know, it could be what you did this summer. It could be a story about yourself. It could just be what you did this morning to get up out of bed. Draw that journey. It doesn't have to be sequential. You're not making a comic strip unless you want to. It just needs to be mm. um, a visual journey. You can put letters in it. You can cut pictures and put them into it. And they start it in class, and I allow them to finish it in um, at home so right. they can, you know, really add on to it. And it's really exciting to see, and they're really excited with the, with the end result. Like, oh, my goodness, I just made something. And they see continuity. They see how they use this blue all the way through this piece and how that brought this whole visual image together mm. completely unconsciously. Just some things that they discover about what they already know about art that have always been there that they never really... Observed. So if you talk to, you study up on some of the, the well-known neuroscientists say, you know, it's the toggling of the left brain or the right brain where the solutions and the creativity come in. And something you said to me yesterday on the phone when we were talking kind of stuck with me through to today. Mm -hmm. You said when I'm having them do three-dimensional pieces or I'm having them do something they're not used to doing, they have to look at it or observe it in a different way. Yes. And I think past elementary school, we're taught to observe one way because we're on that one track, right? Yes. And that one track, whether, you know, Certain, certain families are saying, you know, what do you want to be? Do you know what you're going to be at 10th grade? Pick it because that's the college you're going to. Right. Or some of us are a little more crazy like me all over the board. Try everything. See, <laughs> see what fits on the menu. And there's no real right or wrong per se. But I think what's important about what I want to know about you today is what do you teach kids to look at things from different perspectives so that when they're making that decision, that, you know, where they're going maybe after high school, that they better, they're solving the problem. Not their parents, right. or not some outside source. Oh, absolutely. And and again, I, I go back to that sketchbook again. When I give them an, um, a concept, we're going to be doing, I want you to draw a picture for thus and so. Um, they'll come back to me and they'll go, here it is. I, I did a sketch, like you said. Here's my sketch. This is what I'm going to do. I'm like, no, no, no. I want you to do four, five, six different ideas. I want you to really dig into your brain and mm. think of every single possible way that you could see this and visually. You may love that first idea, but there's another one back in there I know that you're gonna wish you had saved or you wish you had addressed. And if you don't get them all out on the table, you just throw it all out there, then you're not gonna, you're gonna miss something really crucial about yourself and about how you can respond creatively. So the next step is where where do you see them catch those problem solving skills? Like where, what I want the parents to know is like it's just not regular old art class, right? Where you're where the teacher is prodding you along to kind of pull it out of you. Where do you find like it's obvious someone like cre you and I creative. We're gonna go through those six you know thumbnails and woohoo we're on. Right. But what about someone like you know that's a financial major or an inter uh, engineering yes. major? Yes. Like a, my friend Andrew. 
<laughs> what are we going to do about someone that's, you know, in, in that mindset? I will say that some of our clients that have gone on in their lives that are lawyers and engineers, you know what they do in their retirement? What? Art. Oh. So, you know, we know. <laughs> that's what I want to do in my retirement. <laughs> Anyways, I haven't got down that road yet, but so we're into the notebook. Tell me what else goes on because you're teaching photography, you're yes. teaching ceramics. ceramics. I mean, you've got to be multi-talented yourself just to know all of these, you know, areas. Well, to be very flexible, extremely flexible. So that's the the gift of a of any teacher is flexibility. But art teacher in particular, you know, I get a, certif a certification K through twelve art teacher. It's so vague and it's so broad based. When mm. you get into the high school, interesting. And there's so many little facets. You know, we have um, creative computer graphics. We have um, you know, photography, digital photography. I actually teach darkroom photography. Oh, you teach the old-fashioned old stuff. I teach the old-fashioned stuff. You know, we're smelly. It's great. But yeah. the dark room is like the sacred place. Anyway, but it's you. I really have to be flexible because, you know, like I said, I majored in illustration at RISD. I took a photography class. I did take ceramics class. But to be flexible enough to embrace it and then to pass that on mm -hmm. to my students. Because you've got to get kids that come into your class with arms folded, you know, oh, sleeping. I'm not into it. Yes. I'm just here because I have to. Yes, and, and like and to go back to what you were saying earlier, like the, the financial person who comes in, like, well, I wanted to be, I had a student who said, I wanted to be in business, and I ended up in here. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, well, I'm in the dog pen. Oh, as well, you're going to love it. Yeah, it doesn't really sell well. But um, what I end up talking to them about is who they are. Uh, they'll be stuck on, well, I don't know what to draw. I'm like, well, tell me. Um, I One student, you know, how do you decorate your bedroom? What does your mm. bedroom look like? Oh, well, um, I did purple and I did violet and I did all these. And then I have a chandelier. I'm like, well, what does that chandelier look like? Mm. Oh, well, it's black. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. What kind of shapes do you see in that chandelier? So, this student made an entire design based on the chandelier in her room, which she never would have gone to. She never would have thought of mm. had she not just explored, opened up a little bit and thought about, you know, what things do you see in your day to day life that could possibly you could take that, turn it around and make it into something, make it into something beautiful, make it into something that's your own. So even though it's not directly related by having them reframe or re-see or observe, like we started a little bit ago here, <laughs> <laughs> um, they actually then maybe will use that later on in life to say, hmm, maybe I can look at, you know, these choices differently, whether they're peer pressure choices or what college I'm going to choices yes. and kind of just have that. I don't want to say open mind, but just have that expansive view. Yes. OK, so you take that person that wasn't really interested. Tell me, give, give us a, like a story. Give us a case study. The person that wasn't interested and where you saw them. Because you teach them all through the four years, I teach, right? Well, um, I, this particular student I, st I taught for the entire year. This is a freshman foundation or foundations in art. Mm. And um, up until this year, it used to be a two-semester entire year course. They would be, I would see them every single day. Yeah. So those Ooh. kids that were like, oh, my guidance counselor dropped me in here. And, you know, they're the ones that kind of get revved up by the end of the year they're like wow this is really cool you know, they're the ones I'm really trying to you know please I'm really trying to sell to because I want them to understand that this is something that you will use you may never take another art class again and I say this to my students all the time you may never take an art, another art class again but you will always have to create something you will always have to think about an idea maybe it's the logo for your you know multi-million dollar company that you're going to do um, but you're always you know you think about what color you're going to make this or that you know these are choices that you will have to make and having that just that one year or that one semester of art is going to help help you dig a little deeper help you get there a little I read an article, again, thinking about what we were talking about today, about how there was a study done where they took two groups of children, one to a theater and one to a museum, and engaged them and, and gave them different things to look at, think about, and enjoy. And these were kids from the inner city that probably would have never had these experiences. And what it did to them was they came out seeing, seeing different things that probably the typical person that enjoys that regular sort of cultural venue would have. Right. And it was amazing. And it and it enlightened them in such a way that it actually fostered them to ask for more of it. And, yes. you know, in a better way than when you drop them off at the candy store, they ask more of that. <laughs> so so um, I think it's about time that we're going to take a quick break. But I do want to continue our conversation about problem-solving skills and where it fits in with leadership and what what it can do to maybe calm the chaos as we move forward and get ready to go back to school. We'll be right back in about a minute. Right, Rob? Yeah, he gave me the <laughs> thumbs up.
Thanks. Excellent. Healthy, confident smiles begin at Stratford Orthodontics. Conveniently located on Main Street, we are Stratford's hometown orthodontist. We offer the latest in orthodontic technology, including Damon braces and Invisalign. We always accept new patients. Call today to schedule a complimentary consultation. 203-375-8332. Stratford Orthodontics, 2499 Main Street, Stratford. 203-375-8332. And online at StraffordSmile.com. Alliance. We are an industry leader in coordinating transportation for large events such as corporate road shows, conferences, and special events. Our team of experts understands the dynamics and logistics of high-pressure situations and complex arrangements, all within a rapidly changing environment. Since 1999, we have added charter jets, event management, and personal protection to our range of services. Mention this ad for $25 off your next round-trip reservation. Alliance in you. Together, we can achieve the extraordinary. 855-546-6996 or AllianceLimo.com. A variety of food trucks, hands-on activities, live music, a different theme every night, plus top women's tennis. It's the 2015 Connecticut Open presented by United Technologies. Be there as some of the world's best competed at the largest pro tennis event in New England. And catch famous players John McEnroe, James Blake, and more in the Men's Legends event presented by PowerShare Series. It all adds up to one legendary week, August 21st through the 29th, at the Connecticut Tennis Center in New Haven. Get your tickets at ctopen.org. When you experience a sports injury, you want to get better and fast. Coastal Ortho Express gives you direct access to orthopedic care quickly. Their physicians are fellowship trained in sports medicine at world-class universities and are also team doctors for area football teams. For specialized personal care of sports injuries, go to Coastal Ortho Express. Open Monday through Saturday in the iPark building, 761 Main Avenue in Norwalk or CoastalOrthoExpress.com. Coastal Orthopedics, keeping you on the move. Hersa Acorn and HANradio.com. We're back, friends, and we're talking about back to school and problem solving skills and cognitive thinking and how to create calm and the chaos as we move back to school. But more importantly, we're talking about choices. Because uh, my friend M- Margaret and I are busy um, moms, yes. working moms, and we have some tweens. It's very relaxing with the tweens, isn't it? It is. I'm very relaxed most of the time. But anyways, (laughs) what I do find is, and I don't know if it's a function of where we live in the country or if it's just a function of contemporary times, but I'm sure I'm speaking to a variety of moms out there. We're, We're torn on how many activities, where we're supposed to be bringing our children, what they're supposed to be doing, if they're exercising their gifts, if they're exercising their body enough, (laughs) if they're eating well. And that laundry list alone could make a good woman croak. Yes. Yeah. I wish I had the answer for that. (laughs) You don't? (laughs) I wish I had the answer, like the answer. I guess the answer is allow them to be a success. Yes. And so the whole crux of our show today was problem solving skills and cognitive skills and empowering our kids. So along the way, they can push back. No, you know what? I really hate soccer, mom. That's not working for me. Or, you know, I really like um, learning another language, not the one you selected for me. (laughs) (laughs) Or, or, you know, I'm not going to... But then it's rough because then it's like, you told me I couldn't do that. Yeah. You know, after you clearly said, let's just do some Spanish. You said I couldn't do Spanish. (laughs) You never, you never win. There's, Grass there's, is always green. There's, there's, there's no winning. No. There's no winning. <laughs> but I do think in contemporary times, what we miss a lot is we want them to take ownership, and, and then sometimes we take over their ownership. So the reason why I thought art and sports today would be a good thing on this show is because, I don't know about you, but growing up, art and sports were at polar ends of the spectrum, right? Yes, absolutely, yes. And you were one or the other. And more and more, the nice thing is those things are blending. You can be, you know, you can be a jock. You can be the 
freaky artist. You can be a little of everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that also plays into all these choices and decisions that can also make our middle schoolers a little crazy, but it makes us crazy too. Like, well, you got to do that. You got to do that. You got to do that. And don't forget, you need to be prepared by 10th grade to know where you're going to college and you better have really good SATs or you're going to work at McDonald's. Yes. And we convey the wrong messages to ourselves flows down from the leadership. So I know as a creative person, we know through art, art therapy, we had pet therapy on not too long ago. We know through these sort of creative modalities, when we empower people, they help themselves. And I think people take that for granted, um, especially when it comes to art and sports. The sports has its own set of labels, right? Rough and tough and tumble down and, you know, they just get the scholarships to go wherever they want because they're athletic, you know, blah, blah, blah. But really, the things we're talking about today are, yes, we make each other nuts, children and parents, but certain things bring us together and make stronger attachments. So I want to know more about the way that you help people make decisions. Yeah. So hopefully parents will see the importance or the listeners will see the importance and the value of arts. And any of the people that are listening trying to take budgetary money out of arts and sports will kind of rethink it. So now that I've hogged up the mic, go. All right, here I go. <laughs> um, well, in the art room, we have... Yeah, there's the cream of the crop. They're the students who go, like the scholarship students for sports. They're the students who go off and they, you know, have gallery shows or they get their first, you know, job working for Disney or whatever. But they're always these middle of the road kids and you can't forget about them. The ones who just, are, you know, they're just, they're taking this class and it's part of their life experience. And, you know, they're not going to make this huge impact just by taking this, you know, this art class. They're um, not the next Picasso. Right, they're okay. not, and that's okay. And that's all right. And that's right. okay. Just like in sports, you know, um, we're not all going to get a scholarship because we all, you know, we just drilled and drilled and drilled in soccer. You played soccer, and I'll, I'll let John address all that stuff. But anyway. <laughs> yeah, you're on John's turf right know. now. But um, <laughs> come back. Come back to art. Um, but in the art room, again, it's a place, it's this place where you can, you can have answers, and they don't have to be right or wrong. They're your answers. They can be um, problems that you're solving that are, you know, they are your own. You so you can say that in a class, and I've said that in daily drive workshops. Like, it's your own. Don't worry about it. Your neighbor is not looking. We're not judging. But I still see people in our oh, class yeah. doing this. You know, this. <laughs> yes. Are you looking at mine? You Did know. you take a picture of mine? Yeah, Did yeah. you take a picture? You selfied it. No. Or I'll have, actually, I have students who'll say, well, I posted my drawing, and I have four friends who liked it, and that's like a whole nother. Oh, yeah, that's another whole layer. <laughs> whole nother show. That's another show. <laughs> but anyway, um, but yeah, it's very difficult, especially, again, the adolescents, you know, they're very much into um, self-awareness and making sure they, they fit right in and that everything's okay, and I really try to encourage them that it's okay not to. It's okay. No one needs to even see it. Mm -hmm. And even if they do see it, you're sharing. You're sharing an experience. Um, one thing that I learned, uh, I did a workshop in Washington, D.C., and one thing that we learned was that art provides an experience for the viewer. You're providing an experience. And I think when you reframe it that way, it's very important, right? Because when you say it's not really about you, you're providing this experience for the viewer, then it shifts the, you know, that adolescence, oh my God, over to that, uh, you know, to, they're doing something for someone else. Right. And I think that's also important to teach young people. When you do something for some, because they're all so self-centered and not in a bad way. I mean, no. that's part of growing up. Right. But they're, when you say, you know, leave some on the table for someone else or do something for someone else, then I think that shifts that energy around. And when that other person really enjoys it, not only the parents with the art on the fridge, <laughs> it, it starts to, and you know, support that self-esteem right. we're talking about. Empower them. Right. So did you take anyone from point A to point B that you really turned around? I really turned around. Okay. It doesn't have to be really turned around, but it made an impact. So they went off and, you know, maybe weren't interested in art, but it changed their life a little bit. Yes. Um, especially in photography. I had students who just sort of took it because, you know, they knew how to snap some shots. And, and I teach the old school way of photography, you know, developing and taking your time and it really um, I had several students who just they thought they were going to do something completely different and they completely got engrossed in photography and then mm -hmm. what's another photography course I can take Mrs. Caber I'm looking for next year what can I take next well there's digital photography there's intermediate photography advanced photography you know and they get very very uh, revved up about it because mm -hmm. they just having that experience of creating an image 
mm. you know, like that was just really, they just had no idea how exciting it would be for them. So, and how is um, the problem solving different in photography or art, traditional art, line drawing, if you will, than say math, for example? And where are they the same? Well, they're the same in that we talk about variables a lot. Oh. <laughs> there are a lot of variables, especially in darkroom photography. Um, light is a variable. Mm -hmm. Time is a variable. Time, you know, um, we learn a lot about physics and how light works. But um, with photography, it's about capturing that one idea. They are given a thing to explore every week as they learn about their camera. So their uh, one is trickery, where they try and do special effects with their camera. So mm. trying to convince us that something is kind of odd or sort of off without being too obvious. And that speaks to shifting and, and looking at things yes. differently. Yes, and keeping it creative. And so it's not like, wow, I did, you did a picture of your shoe. It's like, <laughs> that is the most spectacular shoe I've ever seen. You know, just trying to think of it a different way. Because I have a, um, there'll be kids in the beginning who I'll say, you know, okay, do a bird's eye, worm's eye. Okay, here's my phone from a bird's eye. And then here's my phone from a worm's eye. Check. Did it. Mm. But I'm looking for, and I'll explain this to them before they, <laughs> before they do this, but I'm looking for, really think of the person who's looking at this picture at the end. What experience do you want to bring to them? Bird's eye. Give us vertigo. What, do you, what can mm. you do to give really, us <laughs> really give us that sense of, whoa, I'm really looking, you know, and it doesn't mean climbing to the top of, a dangerous building or anything like that, but give us that sense of perspective, something in front of something else. Um, so it really helps them like, oh, okay. So they're not just thinking, oh my gosh, before Friday I have to snap 24 pictures. They're thinking, okay, this one's gonna be really good. Um, I'm gonna do it, I need a friend to come. I, we're gonna meet after school and we're going to do this thing with, you know, they'll really orchestrate something for this project and they'll really get into it. So if you've been teaching for 13 years, just give me like a, a broad look from the time you started to now. Ooh. How are the kids in high school's confidence level? The same? Changed? Improved for the better? Um, it's a mixed bag. It's what definitely do you think? a mixed bag. Um, because you factor in all the things that have happened in 13 years. The onset of technology. The onset of millions of extra activities. Yes. Uh, way more than we grew up with, I'm sure. Yes. So what do you think? From an artistic point from of view. From an artistic point of view. Um, well, I see it, it has a lot to do with time, too. In elementary school, it's like an aerobics workout. You know, we come in, we get everything together, and I have to make it exciting, and just, you know, yeah. I'm like the cheerleader, and, oh, this is going to be fantastic, and they pass out the paper, and who's going to do that? And uh, just keeping them engaged for the four, whole 45 minutes, and then they're out the door. And then they catch my <laughs> breath, and here's another class. And, oh, my gosh, and here I go. And then, um, you know, and they're so eager they're so hungry to be engaged to be creative they just can't wait what are we going to do today mrs capron i'll see them in the hall my i would see my elementary kids in the hallway that's the first thing they ask not how are you <laughs> what are we going to do today mrs capron when do we have art again when are we going to get so those when, are the good old days when we get to um high school it's very chill it's very laid back you get no read they could be so excited they're about to burst but you don't s see it at all it's completely you don't know what's going on behind the eyes. But they, and they're more nervous. They're not anxious to jump in and dive in and get messy. They're anxious because they want to do it right. They mm -hmm. always want to do it correctly. They want to do it the right way. I did this, and I did it like you said I should do it. I did it right. Mm -hmm. So allowing them. A lot them, of judgment Yeah, there. allowing them to make mistakes and to just be messy about their mistakes and just make a mess mm. just is very freeing for them and it's freeing for me to watch them to finally loosen up and just take that brush you know we're gonna so has it been easier to be an art teacher or harder in the past five years um it's been harder in a general sense because uh it's they're trying people are trying to or administrators not so much that but states are trying to quantify it do you know what i'm saying like oh no they're quantifying art too they're now trying to quantify it oh and i get it but it's very difficult to quantify experience like that. It's, it's almost like I wish they would go the other way. Yeah, because when you quantify, you judge. Right. You quantify. And you put numbers, judge. and that's, you know, every, um, it's so different too because the kids in elementary school, they're not thinking about their report card. What's an S? What's an N? What's an O? What's a Q? You know, what does that mean? I don't know. A high school, Mrs. Capron, I am two tenths of a point away from a B. Plus. Is there anything I can do? Oh, gosh. 
to, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, I thought you were having fun. I thought we were having fun. What happened? <laughs> Where did that go? So it is difficult because you have to quantify it. At the, in the, at the end of the day. Well, that speaks to the topic that we're talking about. Everybody's making everybody nuts, right? Yes. And, and so, you know, that's another whole show, right, with <laughs> the, the, the measuring of uh, state exams and whatnot. But aside from whatever is being put down in the jurisdiction, if we're moving our kids forward, now we don't have our, um, our evaluations with the parents anymore, but if you were going to tell the parents today what they could do to help their kids be better problem solvers, aside from their parenting they're doing at home, but from a creative point of view, right. what would you say? What would be your top two or three things? Find anything creative in that, you know, the high school has just a whole slew of different electives, different departments. It's not, in, you know, I encourage, I would encourage them not, you know, don't, not just art, but we have fashion design, we have graphic design, we have CAD, we have architecture, we have so many different things and just explore a branch of creativity, even music, even writing, something where they can learn how to create something, how to make something. Without being worried that they know they'll be stuck in that. Right, And right, that'll right. be their career. Right. <laughs> it might help them. Right. Okay. I'll never forget I had, um, it was like my first or second year teaching, and we had an open house, and I was very nervous, and I was just like, ha ha, hi everyone, you know, the parents. And I had this mom uh, take me aside, and she said, um, is my daughter is my daughter gifted? <laughs> and I was, what do you say? Like that's not what I'm looking at. I'm looking at she's having fun. She's having a good time. You know, my, my older self looking back at this poor young thing who had to take on that question. It's like, well, she's having a really, really good time, mm. and I think that's that's and, what. And that puts you in an awkward spot for uh, many reasons, right? <laughs> because then you're back in the judging seat, right? I'm and the you're quanti- not quantifier. You, yeah, you're not really teaching. I'm the, the all you are an artist and you are you know yeah and you are gifted well that's another whole story for another show too right because I think the whole gifted program puts a lot of pressure on a lot of people for a lot of different reasons that may have its benefits and its burdens yes Um, I think if we're ready for another break here we're going to come back in just a minute and we're going to bring on our friend John and talk about how arts and sports and all of this moves everybody down the court and things that we can do to empower our kids and hopefully maybe lay back on ourselves as parents a little bit. Absolutely. Let go and let some things happen. Thanks, guys. We'll be right back. Thank you. Did you know that taking dance lessons is a great date night idea? Arthur Murray Grand Ballroom of- Radio. We're back, friends, with The Drive and Denise 
D. Gregoli. Now, I can't say my own name today. <laughs> Hersham. 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 <laughs> <laughs> on hand love you, Denise. H-A-N Network. Well, it's just got to be something I do. I don't know what it is. It's the coffee. Welcome back. John Kovach. It's close enough. Close Co- enough. Kovach. <laughs> don't Kovach. steal the hairs, please. Sp- Hersham yeah. Kovach. I'm going to be There's booted eventually, I know, for my spelling errors no and my way. pronunciation. No, you no won't. shot. No, you won't. <laughs> Anyways, um, leave it to the drive to bring on two polar ends of uh, the spectrum in public schools we could talk about private schools but both of you work in the public schools arts and sports and john i want you to talk to us today about i mean i think in general people understand what sports do for their kids or they have an overall why they want their children to be in sports but what i want to talk about is what it does for leadership confidence and keeping the family together i would first off disagree that they're polar opposites and that and i would disagree with those who call them extracurriculars. I consider them co-curriculars. There are different ways that people respond. There are different incentives to which people respond. There are people who probably would not attend school if they didn't have that art carrot. There are people I know who probably wouldn't attend, wouldn't pay attention to grades if they didn't have that sports carrot at the end of the day. So Good I would point. say it's just reaching the person and allowing that person to realize him or herself in the way they envision. And it is a journey for each of these young people. So that's well said, and, and you're 100% straight on. And I agree with you. So what do we do um, as parents? Because some of us want our kids to try everything, and then some of us want our kids to excel only great at one thing. And what do we do to empower our kids to find that? and find their individuality in their journey without making us nuts or them nuts. I think you let them try as much as they can early with an eye on overscheduling. Uh, I'm not a parent. Let's right off the bat say I'm not a parent. I don't have kids, so I don't come at it from that perspective. I come at it from the perspective of someone who has worked with kids every day for a 22 years since I started coaching in Fairfield Pop Warner. I was at Fairfield Prep. I was at Platt Tech. Now I'm at Fairfield Ludlow. So I've worked with different demographics, different age groups. Um, So I do have that perspective, and I enjoy working with kids, or I wouldn't have done it. I think you let them, when they are younger, try different things and then find the things that they like to do. What if they like to do things when they're younger, and it seems that they drift away from the things that so they supposedly really enjoyed, and then they begin to drift. Do you see that they come back? Is that part of their journey? Should you, if you, I'll, get, I'll speak for myself. If you've identified something you thought was a really great gift in your kid, and all of a sudden you see them drifting from it, and to you too, Margaret, I don't want to leave you out of the conversation. Is that, do you see that happening? Oh, yeah. And do you see them coming back? And at what point, as an over, you know, driven person for success do you teach the parents to be hands off and let the kid unfold or child i shouldn't say kid i know some of my listeners don't like the word kid they like child well they're probably young adults by the time they reach the level that we're where we both work at the high school level so i would consider them young adults and i think you can't really force them you can talk to them encourage them see what the problem is make certain it's not a situation where it's a negative experience with a specific coach teacher etc and let them fight and maybe they're drifting off to another field of interest if they're drifting off the wrong way then by all means interfere and unfortunately i've seen those situations Mm. but i've also seen where it's just like you know what i just don't want to play sport x anymore and i want to focus on sport b so in what you do for the, the children at Ludlow, how do you, I mean, I can understand the generic ways that we teach leadership and problem solving skills, but give us some of the ways parents and listeners may not know that the, the sports, and we've already talked about the arts, bring things to the table that, you know, create the opportunity to be a problem solver. Well, it's a team atmosphere, and anytime you put 
young adults, children, what have you, in a team atmosphere, leadership is developed, spirits of cooperation, spirits of teamwork are developed. I can pretty much tell in a work environment who was involved in some kind of team or group activity, say a production, a group art effort, a team sport, you can pretty much see who was involved in that and who wasn't into adulthood because mm, of the way they conduct themselves in a group setting with a common goal. And it is all about re- achieving common goals and keeping focus. And certain people rise to the top as leaders. Some do not. Some are not comfortable with that. And that's just part of growing up. Mm-hmm. So um, tell me how I had said in my newsletter, this fosters family attachments. I could chime in and tell you what I think, but I want to hear it from a coach's point of view. How being on teams and being part of a a, being part of a group fosters a family attachment. Well, I I'll take my family for I mean, um, we've I mean, my brothers both played youth football. All three of us played high school football. I have a brother who's two years younger than I am. I have a brother who's nine years younger than I am. Oh, I have a brother nine years younger, too. Are you the oldest? I am the oldest. Are you the oldest, Margaret? No, I'm the youngest. Okay. (laughs) But you take an interest in how your siblings are doing. You want them to Mm. succeed. You want to see how they do. And to the point that, you know, we have a game on a Friday night. My parents are still calling or want me to call to know how how we did. Yeah. My brother, my brothers are, you know, call, let us know how you did. Same with my nephews. It, it, it's you've got that common thing to me. And it gets me through a lot of weeks in a job that can be a grind during the football season having that game on Friday or Saturday yeah. there's there's that thing at the end that I can focus on and the support I think of the family brings it brings that attachment closer regardless of what's going and, on at and, home and you can't do it you cannot do it without support you can't put the sacrifice into being an artist without the support of your family because there's so much that you need to focus on you you cannot put the sacrifice into being an athlete or I, I, even more particularly a coach without the support of the family. I couldn't do this without the support of my wife. And I make a point to thank her almost daily for supporting me in this because it is a very difficult and time consuming thing, but there is a fulfillment to it. So I asked Margaret after 13 years of teaching, I ask you 22 years of coaching, how has the high school, because it's primarily high school you coach, mm-hmm. right? At how, this point, yes. How is it, you know, the self-confidence levels of our teenagers today versus what maybe will go back 10 years? Do I think you, it, 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 it's the same as it is when we grew up. I okay, mean, we're, so that hasn't we're, changed. We're the human animal. I mean, there are teenagers who are going to ascend to the leadership position who... That's just where they are. That's, they have that confidence. They have that air about them. There are teenagers who are going to be your secondary leaders. They're going to be the lead by example, do as I do. There are teenagers who are going to decide that, hey, it's not for them. I want to try something else. And it's your job to tell them, hey, it's okay. I, I've had that happen. I've had that discussion on the field with a player whose brother was an exceptional player, could have gone on to college. His younger brother was playing and just one day was just really having trouble with it. And I had a conversation. I said, what is wrong? And I, you know, he, he had the conversation and I don't know that this is for, I really don't enjoy I said, well, the, you are the only one that can make that decision and you have to do what's best for you. And he said that he had never had anybody phrase it like that to him. And you know what? He ended up walking away from football and he ended up being quite successful. So that I guess the point I was kind of driving at there is, you know, with today's modern technology and how crazy things are, I know that when I was growing up, yes, some of the things you're talking about are exactly the same, but some aren't. My parents didn't have the 500 activities. We're overbooking. We are overbooking. You know, you have to – you can't start – thinking about college scholarships with a third grader and that's what I I don't know if you run into it in yes. the art segment. Yeah, I feel like it's almost like life 
life is ending. We have four years left. We have four years, and we have to get. We have to figure out what we're doing and where we're going to go. And these, and it's like life begins or life continues after right. senior year. It doesn't end. It doesn't so stop. When I'm asking you guys about the difference in the way you see children, is like because I want to get to the point of what the parents can do. Because I think as a parent, we get caught on that hamster wheel of everyone else is saying that. What's my kid going to be in third grade when they grow up? And so, what can we do to leave our listeners today with? It's okay. You know, we've got great people, and we also under. So let's give some kudos to you guys. We have great guys in our public school systems, and you know, as people that work in our community that we underestimate, that we we hand over our children to for eight hours a day times how many you know days in a year, and we take for granted what people like you do every day, and way beyond with the overtime, I'm sure. And so I think because we're all on that hamster wheel, it bears worth repeating here on the drive. And at the same time, I want people to understand that, you know, we are, as parents on the hamster wheel, making our kids a little nuts. And so when we're, and I find myself too, when I get the pushback, it's because I might have started the whole nuts thing. And <laughs> <laughs> but it, So I'm trying to find a common denominator, where to leave well, parents. You want them to be them. Like, I want my daughter to grow up to be Amelia Capron. That's who I want her to be. I want her to be herself. Whatever that means. It could be today she's doing fashion, tomorrow she's doing sports. It's her. Mm -hmm. I want her to be her. And and the reason why I ask that is because I think we see it prevalent in the overscheduling, but there's a deeper thing beyond that. I think it's this constant feeling, and I think it might be magnified here in Fairfield County. Think so? <laughs> uh, of uh, my kid has to go to such and such school, and in order to do that, we have to do all these activities, and they have to be on his resume. And it will, I have to, and if he shows promise in this, I have to invest in private instructors or private coaches, what have you. I have to totally, but we have got to keep these other activities going, and he's got to have a 15 page resume. To to send off to college to get it and he really does he, it, it, we overdo this and we and we burn these kids out and and we do, did I participate in organized activities yes every waking moment of the day no we got together as kids and did stuff yeah. So then, if some of it's true, I mean, because we know that schools are getting more discerning and wanting these big, lengthy, rev you know, experiences and resumes. So where do we, where do you guys, as you know, people in public education and public community service, leave it to teach self-reliant, problem-solving, creative skills, so kids can push back like the the child on the uh, football field that said you know I this really isn't for me and then also let's face it having the courage to say that to the parents because depending on where yes. the parents are right. that might not be yes. well received well that i mean they have to have that conversation i've had that conversation and you just if you can tell the, the teen that it is okay to say maybe this isn't something i want to do it's incumbent on the parent to say you know what then Try something Let's else. Let's encourage him to do what he wants to do or what she wants to do. And, and I would think that that is the most loving gift that a parent can give to a child. And again, this is from a, somebody who's not a parent. But I would think to encourage your child to pursue what your child feels makes them whole is the most loving gift you can give. And if it's not something that like sitting you on did, the couch? Well, that's, <laughs> that's I don't know about I'm that. not going to give. Uh, no, you do not give that. I saw an absolutely frightening, absolutely frightening, totally off topic here, PSA the other day on uh, on that, and where they asked. They asked What's three, a PSA? Public service announcement. Oh, okay. Like an ad. And they asked, they had three generations, and they asked, you know, the grandparents, what was the most memorable thing you did? Oh, you know, I'd go down to the stream and, and you know, do this. Oh, we go out in the fields and pick berries. They'd ask the the next gen, the parents, oh, we'd get every, we'd build the biggest forts. We'd get all the kids in the neighborhood together for a football game. And then they got to the kids who are growing up today. And I, I watched 23 episodes of a show in two days on my iPhone. I sent X many text messages. I that that's the scary thing that we have to get kids away from. And that is 
one of the reasons why, if the truth can be told, down, with my foot down and out, and I had a lot of time to think about what the subject matter could be for a show today, it's, I thought, you know what? That is scary, and nobody really wants to talk about it, but we're all experiencing it, and we're not really sure how to stop the train because technology is part of our world and a necessary part of our world, but it may be also undermining some of our gifts. And so to uncover that, where do you start? In my mind, it was logical to start with education because our kids, you know, from the age five, that's where they are, eight hours a day. Absolutely. And, and what you have to do is view, as I started, the arts, the performing arts, sports, I like what the word, have you, co-curricular. as co-curricular yes. mm-hmm. activities because they are teaching lessons that maybe cannot be taught or are not reaching the student in the classroom because it is a totally different atmosphere, a totally different learning environment. And, and that's what you have to do is get them into a learning environment that they appreciate and then hope that that learning environment grows. And I've seen it happen. And, and I've seen kids who struggled when, you know, faced with, look, you're off the team if you don't get the grades up. I talked, I mean... Our coach, our head coach, talks to every kid's teachers daily. Mm-hmm. He, we do progress reports. We keep on top of that. What I've found in, throughout my career is the athletes perform best, and, and maybe this is true with the artists as well, when they are in season. That is when they are – because then as soon as they're out of season, that discipline fades a lot. I see it in myself at work that I, I feel I am sharper when I'm in season than when I'm, than when I'm in off season. That's interesting. I that's never thought very, of it that way. And you know what? And that's a great point. We're going to take a quick break, and we're going to come right back to finish this conversation on what we can do to move forward in the school year with a lot, a lot less chaos and a little more problem-solving skills. Thank you, John and Margaret. We'll be right back. High Coat Rockefeller Estate is Westchester County's top cultural attraction and is now open for the season. Don't miss out. Go online to HudsonValley.org to plan your visit. Take a drive out to beautiful Sleepy Hollow, New York and enjoy High Cut's stunning architecture, breathtaking gardens, expansive art galleries, and commanding Hudson River views. From world-class art by Picasso and Warhol to expertly tended gardens, there's something for everyone. High Coat Rockefeller Estate a National Trust for Historic Preservation Landmark. Located in the heart of picturesque downtown Ridgefield at 13 Governor Street, Colby's is the area's premier retailer for blinds, shades, shutters, and draperies, and is one of the select few Hunter Douglas Gallery dealers. A family-owned and operated company, Colby's experienced staff will work with you in choosing the best treatments for your home or office and offer free measuring and expert installation. Colby's also carries an extensive line of decorative fabrics including Schumacher, Durley, Tebow, and more. Or browse over 400 books in our wallpaper library from famous designers such as Stroheim, Schumacher, Ralph Lauren, Tebow, and York. Take advantage of our Fashion in Motion savings event with savings and rebates on Hunter Douglas shades with Power Rise technology. Colby's of Ridgefield, we are committed to your complete satisfaction. 203-438-8531. Just because it's no longer boat or beach season, you don't have to abandon your lifestyle. At the dock shop, it's beach season all year long. The Dock Shop has just loaded up with many new products that are perfect for the gift-giving season. Fishing tackle, jewelry, nautical-themed accessories, lighting, tableware, and more. Are you heading out for a tropical winter getaway? Come by the Dock Shop and check out styles by Margaritaville Apparel, Montauk Tackle, Game Guard, and others. Stop in at the Dock Shop and enjoy the New England coast all year long. Boater, beach bum, fisherman, or simply love the New England coast, this is a unique place to shop. The Dock Shop, 51 Tokenique Road, Darien. DockShop.com. It's lots of characters. Specializing in children's birthday parties with your child's favorite characters. When you want to party hardy, when you need to celebrate, call us, we won't be late. We help create lasting memories for you and your child on their special day. 
call us at 203-590-1791 or visit our website at lotsofcharacters.org for more information and to see our party packages. Lots of Characters, 203-590-1791 or online at lotsofcharacters.org. It's grilling season, and Walter Stewart's Market is your local destination for the finest grill-ready certified Angus beef strip steaks, skirt steaks, 100% grass-fed ribeyes, all-natural pork ribs, Arthur Ave style kebabs, fresh-cut veggies, delicious grab-and-go salads, chilled rosé wine, and ice-cold craft brews right next door. Walter Stewart's, your fresh local market, 229 Elm Street, New Canaan, and shop online for groceries and wine delivered to your door at stewartsmarket.com. Hersam Acorn and HANradio.com. We're back with The Drive and Denise DiGregoli, and we're talking today about problem-solving skills and making ourselves nuts and our kids nuts. John Kovach, the assistant football coach at Ludlow, and Margaret Capron, the art teacher at Ward. we got to wrap it up. All right. So what I want to know from each of you is, if you were talking to the parents, what would you tell them to get them off the hamster wheel of putting expectations on themselves and therefore then on their children and what would you do or tell the the children to raise that maximum level of self-confidence because this we all know the time of change go john i would be as an adult be alert to over scheduling realize that if you're doing too much you're not going to do any of those things well let your child find his or her voice and I mean that in terms of expressing what they want to do, expressing the activities they want, let them develop and grow. And let them express that to you because that is going to give them the maximum confidence. If they can walk to you and say, Dad, I really don't want to play football. I'd really rather run, run cross country. I would really rather be in the play. I'd really rather be in the band. And you say, you know what? You go and you be the best at whatever you want to do. Let them do that. I absolutely agree. I think it's really important to empower them, to really empower them to solve their own problems and to um, find their own journey. And I think, especially in uh, younger years, uh, to play. And even in high school, just to play. And, and the thing I'll close with is role model yourself. So don't be uh, worried about what your peers or other parents think of you. Do what you know is right for your own family and role model and let your leadership flow down. Okay, this has been The Drive. You can find us live every Friday here on HAN Network. My friend Rob Adams, station manager, John Kovach, our voice, the editorial director. Did I get that right? And mm-hmm. Margaret, uh, Ward's high school art teacher. I almost want to send Ava to Ward now because you're the <laughs> art teacher. Come on over. Come on back. We'll see you next Friday or find us on YouTube. Thanks again, guys. Have a great weekend. Thank you. You too. And Coffee Break is next on the HAN Network.